guns on the right were bronze, smooth bores. The other two are iron guns, and they were rifles. Six pounder at this time. Um, yeah, go ahead and fire. Okay, the next gun is a 12 pound. This is commonly referred to as the Napoleon. Similar to the 6 pound, but just a bit larger. The smooth bores are usually designated by the weight of their solid shot. So the 6 pound gun obviously had a 6 pound solid shot. The 12 pounder fired a 12 pound solid shot. It was about an inch bigger in diameter. Uh, the solid shot was just for smashing things. What were they made of? Uh, cast iron. And now we come to our rifle pieces. These were made from iron. Uh, the rifle guns obviously had a greater range. They had about a two mile range versus one mile for the smooth bores. They were also quite a bit more accurate because of the uh, spin uh, given to the projectile. So these guns were favored if they had long range targets. If you needed to put ordnance on a precise target at a range over a half mile or so, the rifle guns were the first choice. Uh, inside that half mile, it didn't make a lot of difference. The advantage that the smooth horse had was they shot a larger round. So if you needed more ordnance on close-up targets, they were the preferred gun. So there was a good balance uh, between all these types, and these four were the, the primary ones in both North and South Armies. The gun they just fired was a three-inch ordnance rifle. It's one of the more common iron guns. The next one we see is a parrot gun. And the big difference you'll notice on that is that band of, of wrought iron that is over the breech. That was additional reinforcement. The iron at the time of the Civil War, they didn't have all the alloys we have today. They haven't, hadn't yet started making steel in big quantities and alloying other metals in there to strengthen the iron and give it uh, more endurance. So it was a bit brittle at the time. So that band was one of the ways they found just to strengthen the gun and keep it from exploding when the charge was ignited. Again, this was a, a rifle gun, range about two miles, and quite accurate. Their, their drills are all fairly similar. You might notice some differences in, in particular steps the way they do it, but basically these guns were all muzzle loaders, so the drill is pretty similar. The first thing they'll do it is go out and clean and clear the bore. They'll use a, a, a tool we call the worm first. It's the one with like a spring on the end. That is used to go down. They would turn that, twist it. That will grab any material or debris that might be in there that doesn't belong, and they can pull it out. Then they'll use a sponge that they'll moisten in a bucket uh, of water. They'll send that down. That just helps scrub some of the fouling out. If you've worked with black powder, it's very dirty. The sponge also will help to cool the barrel somewhat and also put out any sparks that might still be in there. The last thing you want to do is put a round that's in a simple linen bag down a tube that has a spark in the bottom of it. Uh, that's bad news if that happens. So they would 
use a sponge for all those different reasons. Then they would uh, bring the round forward and uh, hand it over to one of the men to load into the gun. They use the rammer to force it all the way down to the breech. That action locates it underneath the vent hole. That's where they fire it through and they're all using the friction primers on these pieces today. This was uh, the most common method during the Civil War. It had been developed some time before that. We still use them for reacting today because it's the best way to do this. It's just a, a tube with some priming powder in it. There's a wire in the top. It has a loop on the end. They hook the lanyard to that. When they pull that wire out, it's similar to striking a match. The powder in that tube fires down into the round and sets it off. So we'll do uh, one more round uh, of, of uh, by the piece for you. When we're done, then give them a couple of minutes to clear the pieces and get them safe, and then you're free to go out and uh, look at the guns, ask questions of the crew, and whatever. Okay, buy the piece. some questions uh, take a look at these I think the, uh, the bronze gun here is an original tube just a reproduction but uh, they're accurate so go ahead and take a real close look at it and get some pictures uh, they did have canister rounds the Navy called theirs great because theirs were open they had the, the ring and bolt holding the balls loose they got it open whereas in the, the field artillery they were in a canister so as soon as uh, the crews have gotten everything uh, cleared out before you, go ahead and, and uh, ask questions. How fast can you fire repetitive rounds? Uh, in a panic situation, they could fire as fast as three per minute, but that is very unsafe, and you do that only if you're under threat of being overrun. Normally, they tried to space them out to two to three minutes. That gives you plenty of time to aim the gun properly. If you're firing at three a minute, you're not even aiming. This is usually when you've got infantry that's 100 to 50 yards in front of you, and you need to shoot as fast as you can to hold them off. Uh, but normally, they go about three minutes. That also would keep the gun from overheating. Yeah, three per minute after about three or four minutes of that, that gun, you can't even touch it. It just, it just heats right up. Turn equipment. Okay, a lot of the guns also have some demonstration rounds if you want to see what they look like. And uh, the crews can describe the various rounds, what they were used for. Uh, the specific uh, targets they would be fired at and how they work. <laughs> 